When 10th President John Tyler died in 1862, his coffin was draped in a Confederate flag. Nine months prior, Tyler had joined the Confederacy when his home state, Virginia, seceded from the Union. He is the only president to be buried under a flag not of the United States. Of all of the former presidents still alive during the Civil War, Tyler was the only one to side with the Confederacy. This might come as no surprise, as he was the only one from the South. But he didn't just go along with his state and passively leave the Union. He actually led Virginia's secession movement. During Abraham Lincoln's inaugural address, the new president promised only to restrict the practice of slavery from expanding into new territories and not to interfere with it where it already existed. For Tyler, this was enough to warrant secession. Although he'd been out of the White House for 15 years, the 70-year-old Tyler was still an influential figure in Virginia state politics. He'd initially sought compromise. In December 1860, he met at the White House with President James Buchanan. By February, seven states had already seceded, Virginia looked to be next, and there were talks of war. On February 4th, Tyler presided over a peace conference in Washington, D.C. He opened the conference with a speech proclaiming the greatness of the Founding Fathers and claimed that preserving the Union was his primary motive. As the conference carried on, however, he turned out to be one of the least conciliatory participants. In his view, the proposed compromise mainly served Northern interest, didn't protect the rights of slave owners, and wouldn't have convinced the seceded states to return anyways. Over the course of the conference, he was also in correspondence with Jefferson Davis. When he returned to Virginia a few days later, he presided over the Virginia Secession Convention. Though the peace conference in Washington was still taking place, Tyler was firmly convinced it was a useless effort, and he began endorsing secession. He believed it was possible for the South to make a clean split without war. Many at the convention, however, still supported staying with the Union, believing that Lincoln's terms of restricting the expansion of slavery without interfering with it were reasonable. To Tyler, this was unacceptable. He was also now convinced that the North had no interest in protecting slave owners. John Brown's attempted slave revolt from a year and a half prior had likely only reinforced his belief that slave owners needed reliable protection. Tyler used his influence to sway votes for secession, but wasn't successful in getting a majority. That is until the firing on Fort Sumter on April 12th and Lincoln's subsequent call for troops. This pushed more legislators to Tyler's side. On April 17th, Virginia became the eighth state to secede from the Union. Tyler served in the Provincial Confederate Congress, and later that year, in November, was elected to the Confederate House of Representatives. He would have taken office in March of 1862, but died of a stroke a month earlier. Jefferson Davis, now president of the Confederacy, made Tyler's funeral into a political event, celebrating him as one of the heroes of the Confederacy. Reactions in the North were much different. Lincoln didn't make any public mention of Tyler's death, making Tyler the only president not to have his death recognized in Washington. Papers that acknowledged his death did so derisively, denouncing him not only to devoting the final years of his life to the Union's destruction, but also for his actions as president. The New York Herald blamed Tyler's 1845 annexation of Texas for causing the chain of events that led to the Civil War. The New York Times said he ended his life suddenly last Friday in Richmond, going down to death amid the ruins of his native state. He himself was one of the architects of its ruin, and beneath that melancholy wreck his name will be buried. Though Tyler had the distinction of being the only president to join the Confederacy, he was hardly unique among Southerners. Among Southern senators, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee was the only one to remain loyal to the Union. Sam Houston, the governor of Texas, had desperately wanted his state to remain in the Union, believing secession would only bring ruin to the South. 
However, when all his efforts to prevent secession failed, he ultimately sided with his state. Among presidents, Tyler might seem so unique simply because he was the only former president from the South who was still living at the time. There were other Southern presidents in Tyler's era. James K. Polk died only three months after he left office in 1849, and Zachary Taylor died in office in 1850. There's no way of knowing which side either would have taken. Woodrow Wilson was the only future president living in the South during the Civil War. However, he was a child and was only eight years old when the war ended. Tyler had always been a supporter of states' rights in the extreme, even compared to someone like Andrew Jackson. While Jackson was a strong states' rights advocate, he held no higher value than loyalty to the Union, as best demonstrated during the nullification crisis. South Carolina's declaration that it could simply nullify or ignore federal laws that didn't benefit it led Jackson to threaten military force to make the state comply. John Tyler, then a senator, supported South Carolina on the principle of states' rights, a position which led to him being kicked out of Jackson's Democratic Party. Furthermore, Tyler was through and through a member of the Southern aristocratic planter class. His father was a wealthy planter, founding father, and friend of Thomas Jefferson. From a young age, John Tyler was raised in the demeanor and thinking of the Southern elite ruling class. He owned anywhere from 30 to 50 slaves over his life and may have even brought some to the White House while he was president. Tyler's whole identity was attached to the Southern slave-owning way of life. Some look at Tyler's involvement in secession and his long political history of defiance before that as a testament to his character. Seeing him as someone who was willing to stand up for his values, Tyler's grandson, Harrison Ruffin, was interviewed in 1999 and said, quote, My grandfather was a believer in states' rights. He was a Jeffersonian Democrat. He believed in the Constitution. He believed in your word, that if you gave your word that you were to do something, that you always stuck by it. He stuck to his ideals. He never wavered. He never listened to public opinion as such and changed his thoughts because of public opinion. Biographer Edward P. Crapple also reflected positively on Tyler's character and his presidency, in contrast to most historians. Nevertheless, he acknowledges that any good he did was overshadowed by his betrayal. Quote, Tyler's historical reputation has yet to fully recover from the tragic decision to betray his loyalty and commitment to what he once defined as the first great American interest, the preservation of the Union. To support this channel, consider subscribing and donating on Patreon. Donations from 2 to $15 a month help towards more frequent uploads. Patreon link in the description below.